happy pre-day to thanks uh, Thanksgiving. What what would they call that? Thanksgiving Eve, I guess so. Just want to thank you for being here today. Just just wanted to get on. It's Wednesday. Um, I'm off today. I don't have school today. I was doing homework this morning, among other things, and <clears throat> it's kind of cool. Well, I want to thank you. Thank you so much for joining me. Uh, um, you know, I, I will say this. You know, I've been posting that I'm going to be going to Hollywood uh, on a missions trip, and I need to raise $250 by Friday, not, not tomorrow, but the next week. And then I need, um, uh, let's see, but total I need is $750. So um, I would be halfway home um, if the $250 comes in on uh, on or before next Friday. Um, and then, so I was on another social media platform. Um, I'm on YouTube, uh, Instagram, let's see, tech, TikTok, and uh, Facebook here. And uh, so what I do is I just share. And then, well, anyway, on TikTok, there was a guy who told me, well, God will pay, you know, if he didn't say God will pay for it, he goes, if God is real, then he should pay for it. And that's true. And I just kind of wrote back, uh, I just wrote back, yes, but God wants to involve people um, to invest and to uh, not just invest, but to be a part. And actually, when somebody uh, gives money to missions uh, or a ministry, uh, they are actually investing in it. And people want a return on investment. You know, I mean, I don't take... Um, I don't take investments into my life lightly. I take it very seriously. But but in all honesty, um, if people give to you, they expect a return on investment. And that return on investment may not be from uh, a, 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 on an earthly standard, but it will be on, um, you know, at least recorded in heaven at the least, um, which is really cool. But also on earth, God blesses you. God does these different things for you and to you. So I want to thank you uh, again for joining me. Today we're going to get a little deeper into Romans 1, 2, and we'll see how far we go. But, um, you know, I want, to, I want to just be very, very clear. Uh, Bible study is really important. It's important to me. It should be important to you as well. And that's what we're going after. We're going after this. Um, we're going after doing the interpretive journey uh, in the Bible. And a lot of people, um, I mean, I, I spend a lot of time in the Word. I read it. Um, and then if something catches my fancy, jumps up out of the page, I'll do a little bit deeper study on it. And, uh, and, and to me, that's that's powerful. I mean, if we can do that. Because too many people, uh, Christians especially, will take and listen to a preacher and then um, they will just take their words, which, which if you got a good Bible studying preacher, um, you know, you're going to get good word. But that can't be your food. That's kind of like appetizers so that you can go into the word and you can go and get it. That's really the the idea here. And. Um, that's what I, I want I want to teach us how to do that. Um, it's not really hard. Uh, all you really need is they have this um, uh, blue letter Bible.org, uh, Strong's Concordance online. You got all these things online that you can study the word. Now, the Bible was written in Hebrew, Aramaic, and Greek. All right. In the New Testament, um, they spoke mainly Aramaic, uh, you know, the New Testament times. They wrote in Greek, um, but they were speaking in Aramaic because that was the language of Israel. You know, uh, the Romans, they were Greek. And so people were writing, uh, they were writing to the, um, uh, to, the uh, to, to people, they would write it in uh, either Greek or Aramaic. The Hebrew, they spoke in Aramaic. But they wrote in Hebrew and um, and all. So I want to again go through a couple of things. I want to look at 
the Old Testament and the New Testament. We're going to go to Romans chapter 12, but just hang with me. All right. In the Old Testament, you had Adam, who I, you know, who was on earth. I'm not saying this is when he was born, but he was on earth right about uh, 7,000 years ago. Um, that's kind of sort of when time began. I'm going to go 6,000. And, um, <clears throat> you know, and then, and then you had all of these things. You get up to uh, Abraham, who was uh, uh, 2000 BC. You get to um, David, who's 1000 BC. And then you have uh, at, at uh, 500 BC, you have the, uh, uh, the Babylonian ca captivity um, uh, coming out of it anyway. And, um, you know, because they were there for, what, 70 years. And, um, and then they had this 400-year, uh, what they call silence between testaments. Uh, and so you had Moses and uh, Abraham, Moses, uh, David. Um, you know, you had, uh, you had Nehemiah during the time of the exile, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, who wrote after the exile. You have uh, Daniel, who wrote in the exile. And, um, and then you had the minor prophets, etc. Well, in that 400 period, 400 year period, the, the um, Pharisees uh, were the ruling class. Okay. Um, the, the laws jumped uh, from like 250 to 600 in the, in the old Testament. And then in that 400 year period, they added another uh, three to 400. So you have like 935, 30, whatever rules that and traditions and laws that not only did God speak, but the religious leaders of the day. And then the Pharisees, if I can say the religious leaders um, were full of the religious spirit and they got full of themselves. They thought they were invincible. And so in this time, this is when Jesus comes in this 400 year silence part. Um, and in that time, Jesus shows up when the Romans take over, and um, and that was that. In the 1500s, uh, Luther taxed the 95 Theses, and the Reformation starts. He had the First and Second Great Awakening. I believe we are on the cusp uh, on the Third Great Awakening, which could have could be started already. I don't know, um, but we want to be able to start seeing these things. Um, and how how all of this fits, and so please understand that we're we're we're, we're into this thing, and um and I don't want to spend a lot of time there, but um you know I believe personally that Mark was the first of the Gospels written. It was very um uh, it was very short, very concise, and then of course you had uh, Matthew and John, uh, maybe Matthew and Luke, and then John wrote his, and then. You had uh, Paul right about the 50s and 60s. He wrote uh, he wrote his stuff, and then the other ones uh, filled the place. Um, many people believe the Gospels were written after Paul. I don't know, but I wasn't there. But I just wanted you to, to see how this all, all fits, all right? Uh, Matthew, who walked with Jesus, added to what Mark had written. Mark wrote some stuff down, and... It gave, I think, Matthew an outline. Luke, I believe, is more concise as far as his uh, ability to do the chronology because he was um, he was writing to the lovers of God of all that Jesus began to do and preach. So actually, uh, you can look at the five Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and Acts. Remember, Luke wrote Acts as a continuation of... Um, uh, he wrote Acts as a continuation of uh, of Luke. So here we are. And then uh, Paul, who in the book of Acts starts off um, as a Pharisee of Pharisees. He worked under Gamal Gamaliel and um, uh, he was zealous for the Lord. So to speak, he was killing Christians for God because uh, he thought they were a cult. He thought they were um and, and he wanted to stop this thing. Well, on the road to Damascus, 
you know that you know the story on the road to Damascus the light hits him he falls off his horse and then uh, he ends up <clears throat> hearing from God why are you persecuting me he goes to Damascus on a street called straight he goes to straight street and uh, Agabus comes to to see him or um, is it Annas or Agabus I can't remember uh, I think it was <clears throat> Anyway, I think it was Annas, uh, Ananias, or Annas. Anyway, he comes to, uh, God speaks to him, and actually let me look at so uh, people don't get mad at me. I don't want anybody to be mad at me. Uh, but he ends up going to uh, Damascus, and then he says that there's a prophet um, by the name of, um, oh, let's see. Ananias. Ananias is the prophet that goes to him. God speaks to Ananias and says, um, go to Paul and, uh, and open up his eyes. He's got these things on his eyes. Go to him and heal him. And he says, this man's been trying to kill all the Christians for God. And then uh, God says, I already told him you're coming. <laughs> so how's that for prophecy? Um, it's not just a word of encouragement anymore, is it? I told Paul you're coming. Anyway, and then so Paul spends another um, 14 years or so um, in, in learning and in, uh, in, in transition. And then he finally gets sent out with Barnabas. Mark, John Mark goes with him, who I believe is the guy who wrote the book of Mark. And, um, you know, Barnabas and Apollo, Silas, and these guys go with them. And then, uh, um, <clears throat> and also now understand that that Paul, um, he's now traveling into Rome. He's going there to meet uh, Caesar. Remember, he appeals to Caesar in the book of Acts. And, um, you know, uh, understand that Gaius was a host uh, to the whole church, Erastus, uh, who was the city treasurer in, um, where they were writing this book from, and, um, and all. And so um, uh, uh, Lucius, who I believe is Luke, uh, Jason, and um, they were with Paul at this time. And uh, so he's he's under house, uh, or he's uh, writing on his way to Rome, and he says, I hope to meet you. So anyway, he goes through Romans, and I believe, you know, you just got to read Romans. It's a tremendous book uh, dealing, with, um, dealing with the unification of the Gentiles and the, and the Jews. All right? All that's history. So we just spent, uh, what, 13 minutes of history coming to the book of Romans. Now, Paul is writing in Romans, and I want to get to this part in Romans chapter 12. And, um, you know, the thing I like about the Blue Letter Bible um, uh, edition, you can get it as an app on Apple or um, uh, on on uh, Android. And, uh, and, and what it does is it has the... Uh, the Strong's Concordance in, in, incorporated in it, other um, uh, other things, uh, uh, dictionaries and, and studies in there that you can look. And so that's why I recommend that you get it. So if something catches your fancy, you can go look it up. So here we are. Uh, in Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2, specifically is what I'm going to read. Actually, I'll go back to verse, uh, chapter 11, verse 33, because this is technically a paragraph. Now, they didn't have commas and periods and sentence breaks and paragraphs, um, but the thought here is, Oh, the depth of the riches, both of wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgments and unfathomable his ways. In, in other words, they're so deep for us, we can't really fully get them. And then he says, uh, Who has known the mind of the Lord? Or who has become his counselor, or who has first given to him that it might be paid back to him again. For from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be the glory forever. Amen. And then he says in, in, in this chapter break, he says, Therefore, I urge you, brethren, by the mercies of God, to present your bodies a living and holy sacrifice acceptable to God, which is your spiritual service of worship, and 
Don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind so that you may prove what the will of God is, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So in chapter 12, verse 1, he says, therefore. Now, whenever you see therefore uh, in the word, you always look back to see what it's there for. Okay, so therefore, in light of the fact that that God's riches uh, of his wisdom and the riches of his knowledge are unsearchable, and um, and then uh, because of that, I urge you to, by the mercies of God, to present yourselves. God is all powerful. Remember, uh, uh, Paul in chapter eleven is is defending the Jews, saying, you know. Um, you know, the, the Jews are not cast away, uh, but God is grafting in the Gentiles. So I, I'm, I'm not a Jew uh, by birth, but I am one in the spirit because I was born again. And then so he makes us both one. Ephesians talks about uh, becoming one new man. OK, so from him and from him and through him and to him, are all things. So all things um, are from Jesus. Okay. So, and God and, and Holy Spirit. Now, don't get me wrong. Holy Spirit and Jesus are God. And the Father is God. They're all three and all of them are one. And then, so, because he says, who has known the mind of the uh, mind of the Lord? Okay. As for from God and through him, and to him are all things. All things are from him. All things are through him. And all things are to him. Uh, if you go to Colossians chapter 1, uh, it, it basically says the same thing. And, um, you know, he says that all things are created by him, for him. And so you want to you be able to understand that. So... In light of that, therefore, I'm going to urge you. I'm going to strongly, I love that word, urge. That word urge actually means, um, uh, I'm, I'm cheating here. I'm going to my blue letter Bible. Um, that word urge um, means, uh, let's see, beseech. I comfort you. I exhort you. I desire. I pray that you, um, uh, it's like, I'm begging you, I'm entreating you, I'm admonishing you. Now, when I say admonishing, a lot of people get this vision of their father or something like that. I'm admonishing you by the mercies of God, okay? I'm exhorting you, I'm encouraging you, I'm instructing you, I'm teaching you. There's, a, there's an element of, come on, dude, you know, in that, in that whole thing, okay? I'm urging you. Brethren, so he's talking to men and women here, and um, and understand how, how this whole works, okay? Um, men in the Old Testament, um, you know, and all, and but the Greeks uh, valued, the Romans didn't value women as much as the Greeks did. The Greeks actually believed that that the women were above the men. In other, in other words, they were the ruling class. Um, and then so uh, that's what, you know, so so when you understand that uh, they, they weren't second class, they weren't um, they weren't slaves or anything like that. The Romans believed that women were property. So Paul writes here, I'm writing you and I'm urging you, brethren, by the mercies of God. All right. Uh, that there that you present. OK. And that uh, present. um that word present actually means to, um, uh, it just means to, uh, to provide, um, to place a person or a thing at, one, at, at somebody else's disposal. So you're, you're bringing yourself, your life, uh, before the Lord at, uh, dis, um, uh, to his disposal, um, uh, to present or to show, to bring near. OK, uh, to bring one's fellowship or intimacy um, to prove. OK, uh, I'm uh, I'm 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 urging you and I'm 
to 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 present yourself to God at his disposal. And what does he want us to our bodies? A living sacrifice, not a dead sacrifice, but a sacrifice that's alive, that's alive and well. This word, uh, which is acceptable, actually means um, it means uh, it's well pleasing uh, and it's accepted by God. Okay. Um, now I spent a lot of time in my life. Um, and I don't want to spend a whole lot of time here, but uh, I spent a lot of time in my life uh, doing things that I thought would make me acceptable to God. When all I really had to do was to put my life at his disposal. To put my life at his disposal. That's all I really have to do because that is acceptable to God. That is pleasing to God. And it's my spiritual service of worship, okay? It's, it's my, um, it's my um, giving unto the Lord. It's, uh, it's something that is a, a form of worship. Now, in the Old Testament, worship uh, was actually what happened when you got into the inner court, most holy of holy, into the holy place. You, you start, because you come, you enter his gates with thanksgiving, you come into the inner court and the and the uh, the outer court and the inner court with praise. Now, the first thing that you'll see going into the inner court is the sacrifice, and so that's where they sacrificed for you to take away your sins. There was behind that there was the lever or the um, yeah, and and that lever was to or, or laver, sorry, not lever, but laver was uh, to wash yourself off. So, how does Jesus wash us off? He washes our sins away by the blood of Jesus, but he washes uh, he washes us with the watering of the word. So he wants to, uh, us to come to the word that we can be washed. Uh, is this good? I mean, are you getting are you getting anything out of this? And then right after that, you go into the um, uh, inner court, which has the showbread. And remember, Jesus said he is the bread of heaven. And then you on the other side, you have the, um, uh, the candlestick, you know, uh, the, the seven candles, the three on each side, and the one that sticks up, the more, the, what do they call that? Um, uh, they have that at Christmas time, they, um, <clears throat> they, they light it up. Anyway, this, this, this candlestick is there, and then behind that is the veil, and uh, where where the, the the priest goes in, the high priest goes in once a year um, uh, into the holy of holies. You know they tie the bell around his ankle in case he dies. Uh, if he has sin in his life, uh, he will be killed immediately. And so that's that's the view of the temple. But this is what we're doing. This is a service of worship. The worship happens in the inner court because you enter his gates with thanksgiving. You enter his courts with praise. Praise is thanking God for what he has done. Worship is praising him for who he is. You're thanking him. This is what I did. Uh, I'm thanking you, Lord, for what you've done. Uh, praising him for who he is and then worshiping and coming into uh, intimacy with him is what worship is. So in order to do something that is pleasing to the Lord, that is uh, that that is something that takes him. You present yourself, or you're giving to him, uh, making at his disposal your life. Okay, and then Paul says this really interesting thing, and then I'll hopefully I can get this done in five minutes. He says, "Do not be conformed to this world." So here we have this added on thing. So present your bodies, and don't be conformed to the world. Okay, and then you have a contrast, but be metamorphosized, and we talked about it last week, but be metamorphosized um, by the renewing of your mind. Now, remember, who has known the mind of the Lord, chapter 11? So we have to renew our mind so that we also walk in the mind of the Lord. Okay, <clears throat> that word conformed, um, 
<clears throat> excuse me, that word conformed uh, means it's it's a it's a verb, and and, and what it actually means is um, to be um, to to be formed as okay. Um, so you're you're forming your character, and you're and you're and you're forming it to another pattern. Okay, so he's making this contrast here, and he's saying, "Don't form yourself to the pattern of this world." Okay, don't form yourself with the pattern of this world. Okay, and just like Peter in First Peter one fourteen, he says, "Don't be conformed to the former lusts." which you're, were yours in ignorance. You know, you, you did this before. Don't do that again. Don't form yourself into that, okay? Um, so don't, don't, don't be into that, but, but have this, um, um, have your mind and your character to be um, not patterned after the, the society that you live in, all right? But have it metamorphosized and renew your mind. I love that word, renew. Um, renewing your mind basically means, um, uh, let's, let's get it here. Uh, <clears throat> excuse me. Sorry for the silence, but to, to renew is uh, uh, making it better, a renovation. Like, you know, you, uh, when a lot of people, they have their houses renovated. It's the same thing as like the, the, you renovating your mind. Well, how do you renovate your mind? You renovate your mind by um, turning away from how you thought about something to how you think about something. Remember, Paul, to go back to chapter 33, or chapter 11, verse 33, he's talking about the mind of the Lord are unsearchable. So let your mind and let your heart search on those things. Start to fathom, um, just start to fathom uh, his ways. All right, remember, it said that uh, Moses knew his ways. The people knew the law, but they didn't know God's ways. So we need to start coming into his ways. And how do we do that is by renewing our mind by by taking our mind and not following it after the pattern of society, okay, whether it's the religious part of society or if it's the earthly side, the the sinful side of society, uh, but we are we are we are taking it away and we are uh, coming into it and saying, Lord, I'm renewing. In other words, make my mind like yours. Now we have already been given the mind of Christ. God has already given them, us the mind of Christ, remember, but you have the mind of Christ. Paul said that. So we have the mind of Christ already. However, we need to stay away from the, the thought patterns of our society. Don't think in terms of the first world. Think in terms of the third heaven, where we are uh, seated right now. If you are a Christian, you are seated right now in heavenly places with him. You're already there. So you, you battle, you do your spiritual battle, you do your life living in the third heaven. So we, 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 we become transfigured, and we talked about that last week, uh, by the re, re renovating of our mind. So that, and now we have a cause and effect. You do this part, you're not conforming, you're presenting yourself, and you're not conforming. But you're renewing your mind, and the reason why you do that is so that you can prove what the will of God is. So that you can prove what the will of God is. And I love that word prove. Oh, press the wrong button, sorry. The word prove actually means um, uh, to approve or to discern, or to examine, or to allow, to test, uh, to scrutinize. So you can scrutinize um, what the will of God is uh, when you present your bodies, when you are 
uh, in this spiritual service of worship. And you are able to, to then uh, um, uh, deem worthy or uh, you are scrutinizing the will of God in, in doing those things. And Paul adds on to that, that which is good and acceptable and perfect. So the will of God is good, the will of God is acceptable, and the will of God is perfect. And we'll get into more of that on Friday. Um, so uh, in understanding what, you know, you can get a lot of stuff. Now, I, I, want, to, I want to just close with this. In, in studying the Bible, you take your verse, and you, or verses, whatever you're going to do, and you write down just observations. Make observations. You don't have to be a, a rocket science, and I don't know why everything has to be compared to rocket science, but you don't have to be that if, you know, in order to just make observations. You see the word but, you know it's a contrast, or you see therefore, and you go back and see what it's there for. It refers to something before. Those are two observations. And, oh, that's a conjunction, and it joins things together. Oh, there's some lists, there's some uh, um, contrasts, there's uh, cause and effect, there's a whole bunch of stuff. And you make these, and you just write it down. Now, you know, yeah, it, it may take a little while, but if you spend like 10 minutes a day on a verse, and then you go back to it later, it doesn't take much. I believe this, if you're going to get uh, healed in your body, heal in your mind, heal in your uh, uh, soul, what you need to do uh, and I do this, uh, spend three times a day for about five minutes just meditating in the Word and, and, and stuff, and then take one day when you don't do anything uh, that is um, normally what you do, and then you do something different just to relax. In that time of day, you have three times, uh, five to ten minutes, and I recommend, I mean, I have a book called SOS, A 50-Day Journey into the Heart of God, shameless plug, and, uh, and, and it's geared for five minutes per day for 50 days. And then you can take your Bible and you can take out uh, um, uh, bluebible.org. And then you can go into that and you can look at the verses and you can do, do a little bit of Bible study in five minutes. I recommend that you do it five to ten minutes a day. You know, and then uh, just to be with the Lord, stop periodically during the day just to honor him as God. All right, well, that's all I'm going to do today. We'll, we'll talk again on Friday. We'll pick this theme up on Friday. And um, anyway, well, God bless you guys. Thank you so much for joining me. And um, yeah, so we'll talk to you the next time. Bless you guys.